I would like to move on to our opening keynote conversation. So I'd like to invite Allison Kelly and Tanya Holland to join me on the stage. Hi, Tanya. Hi, Allison. Good morning. Hi. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I, am, I have so been looking forward to this conversation. Uh, we'll be talking with uh, professional chef and cookbook author Tanya Holland, who is the owner of Brown Sugar Kitchen in Oakland. And those of you in California have likely been to her amazing restaurant. And also Allison Kelly, who is the CEO of ICA, which provides coaching, connections, and capital to grow Bay Area businesses and close the gender and racial wealth gaps. Um, so again, welcome. We're so glad to have you here today. And we're going to be talking about the capital and capacity building needed to meet Black, uh, Latinx, Asian, and other entrepreneurs of color where they are and disrupt the financial system for good. So Tanya, let's start with you. You're a professional chef, restaurateur, podcast host, cookbook author, and owner of Brown Sugar Kitchen. So you've done so much work in the food system. Can you tell us about the connection, the thread that connects all the work you do in food and the goals and vision that you have for your work? Yeah, I mean, what connects it is that it's all very entrepreneurial. Um, you know, so there's, there's really like, um, you know, no real format that says like, this is what this career is going to look like. There's not like a, a uh, trajectory that's net, that's been done before, just like, you know, a path that is obvious. Um, and it's very dependent. My work in is very dependent on me as well. You know, there's a lot of different components and I, I work with a lot of different people, but it's really dependent on me and my vision and executing that. Can you tell us a little bit about your vision and, and you know, what you are creating? Yeah, well, I mean, for a long time, I've had the vision of, you know, I've been emulating a lot of uh, chef restaurateurs and restaurateurs that I've known for years who have built, um, you know, these empires, if you will, with the different, a lot of the different components that you mentioned that I have being a restaurateur, being a cookbook author, being a TV host, um, and to be able to leverage that into uh, a financial model that's more sustainable, which um, a lot of times can be dependent on consumer packaged goods or, you know, branding where you can get, um, uh, you know, that's more product-based and less people-based because I think what everybody is seeing right now uh, that the hospitality industry is very fragile because it's so people-based and if, you know, the wages and employment and um, housing, real estate is not 100%, you know, in line that it can just fall apart really easily. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know. Can you <laughs> No, that answers your question? Absolutely. Well, you do so much work in the food space. I've really been enjoying your podcast. And, and we're going to dig into your experiences as an entrepreneur in our conversation. And so, so glad that you're here with us today. And this conversation really is about digging into, again, the, the capital and capacity building that entrepreneurs need. And this is, this is an area of, of deep importance for not only the broader food system, but definitely the natural and organic industry, which I know we've got a lot of companies that fall within that space. And my company, New Hope, and the Jedi Collaborative last year conducted a benchmarking survey to learn more about the demographic makeup of the natural and organic industry, company and board leadership. And that survey demonstrated that people of color are significantly underrepresented in industry leadership. In fact, black professionals make up only 2% of company leadership and only 2% of board leadership within the natural and organic industry. And beyond representation alone, we really need to focus on access to capital and, and networks and information. And that is a major challenge that we need to take up. And Allison, ICA has played such a vital role in creating opportunities, access to capital, and, and access to networks in the Bay Area for Black, Latinx, and other entrepreneurs of color. 
Can you tell us more about ICA, your role at the organization and the services that you provide to entrepreneurs in the food industry? Sure, Carlotta, thank you for having me. And Tanya, I'm thrilled to be here with you. Um, you. So <laughs> uh, ICA accelerates great businesses through mentoring and investments to close the racial and gender wealth gaps. That's our mission. It's a refreshed mission uh, that we came up with a, about you know, six or seven months ago, shortly after I joined the organization as CEO last June. And the organization is over 20 years old, 24 years old at this stage. And we've evolved over time from just being about creating social networks for entrepreneurs through advising, uh, to providing education, to a more formalized accelerator model. And uh, lastly, we, we started an investment practice um, about 2013. And while we do play a role, our impact so far has been um, pretty small. And I just want to name that up front. We have big vision similar to Tanya and um, are, are ramping up to execute on that vision. But part of the role that we play is providing a different type of capital into the small business community. And a lot of food businesses have a hard time getting capital from banks. And there are many CDFIs, community development financial institutions in our community to serve entrepreneurs. Uh, and yet most only offer term loans. And uh, I'm sure Tanya can speak to how crippling it can be sometimes to take on a term loan when you really are on a growth trajectory. Your business just can't quite um, service the debt uh, with regular payments, et cetera. So what we offer is a convertible note structure, which is which is innovative in small business financing. It, those types of structures are usually used for larger businesses, um, but we leverage it to really overcome some of the systemic racism and sexism that's intrinsic in our financial system at this stage. We can get into that a little bit more in, in a bit. Awesome. Thank you, Allison. So grateful to have you here as well. And Tanya, let, yes, let's move to you and, and talking about some of the unique experiences you've had as a African-American woman entrepreneur in your entrepreneurial journey and also your, your funding journey. What, what have you faced over the years as you've been building your businesses? Um, well, I mean, you know, just, I mean, it's a long list. <laughs> um, you know, just from early days of just having information kind of withheld from me when I, I sought it out, I'm, I'm very proactive in, you know, um, just trying to excel my career and myself and provide my own opportunities. And, um, you know, I was told by a banker in Boston, you know, 20 some years ago, like, it's going to be really challenging for you as a woman, um, because men will get together and kind of form like a football team and they'll get each other's back. But it's, you know, what I learned early is like men will get behind men. Um, and women will obviously get behind men too, but very few men will get behind a woman who's a leader. And that's trickled down even into, you know, operating my own business and having people, you know, really accept my leadership as a black woman. Um, my expertise is often questioned. Um, my, my, um, um, you know, all of my like authority is questioned and taken away. If there's a if there's a white male within a small vicinity, he will automatically be deferred to as the expert or a male in general. Um, even though I've been in the field for you know 30 plus years at this point, so there's that. And when I was you know trying to lease my first space 12 or more years ago, uh, you know my. Uh, my standards were constantly questioned as to like the type of space I wanted to create as far as design and architecture. Um, you know, I was told to just kind of have less ambitions around, um, you know, what the space could look like and then no one would lease to me. So I ended up kind of marginalized in West Oakland. It became a happy accident, you know, the little restaurant that could, but it wasn't my vision, you know, and then I had to bootstrap that and Basically, I raised $110,000 in five to $10,000 increments to open, you know, a restaurant that at the end of the 10 years at that location, um, the revenue was $1.2 million, 50 seats, 
just breakfast and lunch, no alcohol. So that was pretty significant, you know, what we were able to create. Um, and then, you know, I couldn't even sign that lease until my, you know, then husband uh, signed it. So even though the landlord was willing to lease to me, you know, again, a male, and then I was having a lot of um, meetings with investors and, um, you know, my um, then husband came to meetings and then it was like, there was, you know, it, they made, they felt more comfortable. And even though he, had, he did not come from the industry at all, didn't have the knowledge that I had. Uh, so that was a bit frustrating. And then, it, you know, I got this great opportunity to open up at the Ferry Building and I couldn't, I beat out seven very notable chefs uh, for the lease, could not raise funds, um, couldn't finalize it until I secured a male business partner. So it's just, you know, there's been a lot of, um, I don't know, you know, because I have the intersectionality, I don't know if the gender or the race thing, which one is, you know, is uh, more significant, but uh, they both have slowed me down. Um, you know, I just felt like if I had the resources and the opportunities that I had, you know, I had prepared for, wasn't like I didn't know what I was doing, um, that I would be a lot further along in, you know, my, my journey right now. Well, to hear those stories, have you found over time that is, do you continue to face the same level of barriers? Does your success help you? Um, does it diminish the barriers or is, is this kind of a constant that you continue to face? Well, I mean, you know, there's different measurements of success. So I've had, you know, media exposure that, um, you know, makes it appear that I'm more successful than I am, um, you know, definitely, um, not financially, but um, the media exposure, you know, sometimes in the past couple of years, it's given me access, you know, more attention uh, from from people. And then also just the fact that I've been able to sustain a business with such limited resources for almost 12 years. So that, you know, kind of shows just the tenacity that I have and, you know, and so that's, I guess, um, you know, so it shows something to investors. But I'm constantly just looking around, trying to create new opportunities for myself. So I pivot, you know, before COVID, I, I would, I always like am looking, okay, this door is closing. Uh, this one's not opening, but I'm going to go look in a different direction and see, you know, so that's why I did, you know, the book projects or more TV projects or, you know, side consulting deals um, just so that I could at least survive so that I could have, um, you know, more um, energy to devote to my own business that maybe was under-resourced, but, you know, again, to just continue to look and, uh, you know, leave no stone unturned, so, so to speak. But still, you know, again, my authority and my expertise gets questioned on a daily basis um, um, on this sort of you know, it's it's a it's just a, a cellular innate level of you know you know just what the the norm in society has been um, in terms of how they perceive uh, black women, and particularly black women in business or black women in leadership. Well, I I I it's hard to imagine how frustrating that that must be and. And Allison, ICA takes a systems approach to addressing um, these kinds of issues and creating parity and access to capital and, and other resources for all. And yet uh, you've noted that even ICA has faced barriers in its work to help entrepreneurs like Tanya access the capital they need. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about what you see as the greatest structural barriers um, African-American, Latinx, and other entre entrepreneurs of color still face today and how ICA and others are working to dismantle those barriers? Sure. Um, yeah, it is incredibly frustrating, even as a bystander, you know, having known Tanya now um, going on a year and watching her journey pretty closely. I mean, we're neighbors when we're in person. <laughs> um, Brown Sugar Kitchen is right next door to our, our workplace. Um, you know, for us, we're essentially an intermediary. So we also uh, have to raise capital from investors and then we redeploy it into the community. And some of the challenges that we have had is that our investors have expectations of us and restrictions on their capital that 
keep us from being able to do any, you know, exactly what we want at times, right? So um, we were talking to, to Tanya about a potential investment. And then um, when, you know, she made the right business decision to close the ferry building office, we were hamstrung from being able to provide her the capital because the capital that we had left was restricted to San Francisco. Um, and so we see some of these barriers even in our own investors, although we have great supportive investors who are aligned with our mission, um, they then also are dealing with restrictions. So from a systems perspective, you know, what we have seen and part of the reason why we refreshed our mission to explicitly talk about um, our desire to close the racial and gender wealth gaps is because the data shows that the, that the biggest barrier that keeps people from accessing capital is lack of assets. And it's these lack of assets that has been structurally created systemically for hundreds of years that have left out um, particularly black entrepreneurs, African-American entrepreneurs and women. And so what we're trying to do is really take a thoughtful approach to everywhere that can show up in a financial transaction and try to overcome it. So I was talking a little earlier about our convertible note structure and what this capital um, product enables us to do is to not look at credit scores and not look at collateral and secondary sources of income when we're underwriting a business, but instead look at the integrity and potential and track record of the entrepreneur and their forecast, you know, what, what their business plan says they can do and what we believe they are going to do. And, uh, and then we invest in them. And you don't see that as much, uh, certainly not in, in debt products, typically. And um, we don't see that same level of willingness to take a risk or a perceived risk in small business lending in general um, and particularly as it relates to food businesses, which are seen and restaurants in particular, <laughs> very risky. Um, but we've seen, you know, with, with entrepreneurs that have grit and tenacity, as Tanya was explaining, and those are pretty good people to bet on. That's what it seems like the tenacity that, that, that you've been able to demonstrate through your career, Tanya, is, is really impressive. And what Allison was just describing, does that, um, is, does that resonate with you in terms of the experiences you faced as you've gone out to raise money? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't have any assets, you know, and um, uh, so I don't have anything to leverage in that way. And I don't, um, you know, and I don't have a, a credit profile that is, you know, something that is admirable, <laughs> you know, my, um, I mean, I took, a, I made a lot of sacrifices for my career in terms of, you know, I, well, I mean, some of them were intentional, you know, I, I had to go where the work was, but um, I had limits placed on my compensation as well. You know, I saw my white male counterparts getting more opportunities and more compensation than I did, than I had. Um, and then I, you know, I didn't work in corporate environments. I didn't work in hotels or cafeterias. So there was no, you know, benefit system. I always worked for independent operations and you can never, you know, build a nest egg. Um, you know, I think I had one job that had a 401k plan, you know, like years ago. Um, and, you know, for me, I think that one of the biggest barriers, and we can address this in another conversation, is the whole real estate model just doesn't fit into the hospitality industry in terms of the business owners and, you know, what they can afford, what that line item is on their P&L. It should be more of a partnership with the landlord or, or the developer and also um, in terms of housing for employees, you know, employees, most employees can't live near where they work because, you know, there's just not a, a mix use of housing. Um, and that just like, really is a big wrench in the system on so many levels. Um, so, but yeah, I definitely, you know, I, Allison and I have had numerous conversations. I feel like she really understands what some of my hurdles have been. Yes, and you, you both brought up credit scores and um, as another way the current financial system can block access um, to capital for black, brown, and other people of color. And can you talk more about that? What, what 
um, people here attending this conference need to understand about credit scores and, and um, the systemic and structural uh, bias that is built into credit scores? Sure, yeah. I mean, credit scores are um, complex algorithms and uh, they take into effect, you know, and uh, they take in a lot of different data from a, a bunch of different sources. And in the lending environment in particular, we are taught that credit scores are just one of the pieces of information. It's like just part of the checklist, you know, you just use it, you get it, and a credit score in a certain band is good, and a credit score below a certain number is bad. And um, there are many uh, financial products, including most uh, all of the SBA products, which if you don't have a credit score at a particular um, uh, number, if you're below that number, you're just ineligible right off the bat. Um, but these credit scores, part of what is comprised in them are you know, assets. And um, one of the things that we know about credit scores is that um, up to 25% of credit scores are wrong. So they're, they're not actually uh, true reflections of that person's um, financial stability or their ability to pay back a loan, um, their resilience, their ability to you know, really grow their business. It's just, it's, it's been a proxy for a long time and it's been convenient. It's a convenient proxy. And I'm not saying that we just should throw them out altogether, but I'm just saying they're not enough. And so for what I've seen in my career is this trend towards more automation and more efficiency and streamlining and how we think about underwriting businesses. And the challenge is that those, those ways of automation can create efficiencies and they can create potentially additional access, but they can also really dehumanize the process. And they can also continue to exclude entrepreneurs of color, particularly black, brown and black entrepreneurs. And that's what we see. Right, that's what we see, and that's what ICA is specifically targeting to address. We want to overcome these barriers. We want to not look at credit scores when we're when we're underwriting businesses. We don't want to see any more PPP distribution, for example, after a pandemic that is, you know, blatantly leaving out entrepreneurs of color. And the rates of of business closure for Black and Brown entrepreneurs across this country is just unacceptable. Absolutely, and your notion of credit scores being one of the tools as, as PPP loans as well of dehumanizing um, the whole system and blocking access to capital. It, it's a good segue into the next question I wanted to ask you, Tanya, because the, I, in some ways the opposite of that are human relationships, the people you can get to know and develop and nurture connections with over time and how essential those human relationships can be as part of your uh, an entrepreneur's journey. And when we were doing our planning, Paul, you were talking about um, just how important some relationships have been for you as you've built your, your business. Can you, you talk about some of those important relationships um, and how you as an entrepreneur have nurtured the, the, the connections that have helped you along the way and through a system that has has really put up a lot of barriers for a African-American woman entrepreneur. Yeah, um, you know, I got involved in my community really early and, um, you know, met my lo local council person. Um, you know, that helped when I was looking for some ways to uh, abate graffiti or get better lighting or, um, you know, do other improvements outside of my, my building space. Um, but, you know, that's one thing I want people to realize, like, I'm not just there trying to cook and trying to serve, like I, you know, there's all these other hats I had to wear. And, you know, West Oakland at that time, there, there was just a lot of, um, you know, it, it, was, it was very challenging in terms of petty crimes. And so I, you know, I continue to build those relationships with, um, you know, the community leaders, uh, over the years, I've I've had a lot of relationships I've built with media, uh, food writers, and that has helped me. It was only a couple of years that I, um, you know, set aside some money to pay a publicist. Most of the publicity that I received have come through my relationships, people that I've met at, you know, events and conferences. And um, again, I continue to reinvest in myself by, um, you know, making certain sacrifices to 
volunteer to donate meals, say to a fundraiser. So when you do things like that, then, you know, those organizers remember you and um, they call you for something else. And then at those events, there's a lot of people uh, with means. So I, I, I have held on to those relationships. Maybe they're future investors, maybe not. Um, and just, um, you know, just kind of keep, just keep at it. Like slowly, you know, I've said over the years, like, talk to anyone who will listen, listen to anyone who will talk and, you know, just kind of keep plugging away. Um, and, you know, it does pay off. I've stayed on people's radar. I'm very responsive when the media contacts me. So, and, you know, I've invested in um, my own, you know, food photography, my own headshots, um, my own reel. Like these are just like this money that I put back into myself so that like, I can get it out there when, you know, somebody um, contacts me and it's really paid off, you know, since um, the, uh, since COVID and the movement, um, you know, a lot, there's a lot more support for black owned businesses. People are, I, f I feel like finally uh, giving me the platform and not only to say what I want, but also to listen to what I have to say, as opposed to when I felt like I would say in the past, people would, uh, kind of seemed like I was crying wolf and, you know, I'm not a victim. I've never felt like that. I'm just like, well, I just, this is what I'm experiencing. I just want you guys to know it. Um, but, um, you know, again, I feel really strongly that despite all that, I've been able to create, to create something very significant and, you know, I continue to do so. And it's just the beginning. It just, but I just always imagine like what, what I could do if I had more resources, you know, if I didn't have to have all these starts and stops and, you know, could just kind of move, continue to move forward and flow. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, this little wave that I'm experiencing right now will be, you know, one that I can ride out, you know, for a few years. Yes. Tell us about that, that wave, because in our planning call, that was another thing that you shared just some of the, um, some of the things that have happened during this time of, of COVID that really have um, added to the wind in your sales. What's up, so yeah. what are some of those stories? <laughs> yeah, it's been phenomenal. Um, I think like it's, yeah, it's just been amazing. So, you know, just sort of like one media piece has led to the next, um, but also, you know, the James Beard Foundation has been, who has been looking inward for a long time, have decided, um, to really make some changes and they've appointed me to their board of trustees and I will be the chair of the awards, the chef chair um, of all the awards, I guess. I'm going to be replacing the outgoing chair, which is always a chef. So that's really significant and will give me a chance to uh, have some impact. Um, and I don't even know if I told you this, but in the past couple of weeks, I've secured a pilot for my own cooking show on the OWN network, Oprah, Oprah Winfrey network. So that starts taping in about 10 days. Just yesterday, I found out that my next cookbook has been purchased um, by 10 Speed Press. So I'll be working on that. And I just told my assistant, like, we, we can't say yes to anything else. But then the New York Times <laughs> called last week. And they want me to do a video for Thanksgiving. Uh, so of course, I said yes to that. <laughs> um, so there are yeah, it's just, I can't even keep up right now. And then, you know, I launched my podcast in June, which was um, underway pre-COVID, but the timing was impeccable because I was able to catch a lot of really notable people at home to talk to. And uh, that's just something that I've always wanted to do. And in our, in our business, we have takeout and we have some outdoor seating and um, the sales are, are, are going great. And um you know, I just am grateful for this period of time where I'm getting the support. You know, I've, I've always been ambitious. I still have so much more I want to accomplish and, you know, still need the resources to do them because um, it's still, you know, there's still many challenges um, in terms of, especially with the people part, you know, creating the team I need to really um, to get to that next place. And of course, you know, some capital, but um that is like, because we're not open, you know, full on, um, it's there, but um, 
you know, there's, there's other things that are happening to support me. Well, with all that you have going on, I just uh, want to op offer you an extra large amount of gratitude for making time to be part of this conversation and sharing your stories with all of the entrepreneurs and investors who are here. And we have just a few more minutes. And so in closing, I wanted to direct this conversation to, um, to the investors and others who are, who are attending today and, and just wondering how can they help, best help, like what are the things they can do right now to help entrepreneurs like Ta Tanya and other um, uh, entrepreneurs of, of color accelerate justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in their own businesses and in the food system? Are there practical steps that you think they need to be you know, focused on right now? And Allison, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, you know, there's so much of what Tanya said that I just really want to dive into. Um, one thing that's really resonating for me is how she feels like finally people are listening to her. They're not just letting her talk, but listening, right? So as investors, I think we have a real um, moral obligation actually to listen to our entrepreneurs, especially those that have a different experience than we do, right? I mean, some of the stories I've heard from Tanya's experience in her own kitchen, with her own business partners, with her own board of advisors. It's, um, as she mentioned earlier, and Tanya, I think you're doing a great job of not overemphasizing it, but it's a constant derision of, of expertise, confidence, uh, um, agency in your own business and your own vision. So I just really want to emphasize how important it is to listen to other folks' um, experience and and believe it. <laughs> um, as investors, I think we can do a better job of that. The other thing is, you know, especially in debt financing, we constantly are looking at what can possibly go wrong if we lend you our money, right? I mean, it's a very scarcity mindset type of dynamic that gets created. And we're like, what's going to happen? What are we risking if we give you our money? Um, and I'd like to challenge ourselves to think about, could we put this, change this paradigm? Could we say instead, what are we risking by not investing in this business? What are we risking by not getting somebody like Tanya, the capital that she needs to actually create the first national restaurant chain run, led and owned by a woman of color and a black woman? African-American women. I mean, like, what are we risking by not doing that in today's day and age? Um, so that's what I'd like us to, to challenge ourselves with and come up with better ways in which we can uh, think about the risk paradigm and, um, the, and really differentiate real risk versus perceived risk, credit scores. Yeah. <laughs> such good, such good advice. And, and Tanya, We'll give you the closing word on this. What is what is your um, suggestion for the investors who are attending today? Well, to Allison's point, I've said this, and you know, this is not coming from a place of ego. This is just like I, my realistic, um, you know, what I know about in this industry is if I, you know, Tanya Holland cannot accomplish what I set out to do, given like my perseverance and my tenacity, like. How are the next generations going to feel that they can get there if they if I can't set the example of again creating this national and international um, you know concept a la you know Emerald or you know what Mario Batali did or you know Wolfgang Puck I mean these are you know that's who those are the standards that I'm like trying to get to and um, if I can't get there who how else are these other young women going to get there? So um, I feel like, like Allison said, you know, what are you missing out by not investing in someone like me who has a good track record um, in terms of, you know, sustaining a business? Well, it's a wonderful way to end. And I think a question that I hope all of the investors and others attending today will hold in their mind, you know, as they see um, the amazing entrepreneurs pitch today. What could we be missing out by not investing in these people and their businesses? So thank you again for just a very insightful and um, needed conversation today. And Jasmine, I will pass it back to you. 
Thank you, Carlotta. Um, and again, I mean, just to reiterate what you said, um, thank you for guiding such a session, but thank you, Tanya and Allison, for sharing your insights. And again, congrats, Tanya. That is amazing news that you shared. Thank you.